Washington football. Woo! Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Burgundy Zone. I am your host, Kyle, and I'm joined by my two co-hosts, Michael Hall and Michael Reed. We will be joined by Sam Fortier of the Washington Post here very shortly. But, man, has today been an electric day for the Washington Commanders, something that we are not used to, uh, to be perfectly honest with you. But before we get into all the news, just wanted to say the Burgundy Zone is a part of the Frederick Podcast Network. You can find out more by going to www.listofrederick.com. Boys, first thing that we got to talk about, this Deron Payne contract extension. We all knew about the franchise tag being at $20 million being implemented, but Reed, he just signed the four-year $90 million contract extension with $60 million in guarantees. What was your reaction? Love it. Love that for him. I also, shout out Ron Rivera, man. He's getting all these these cornerstone guys locked up long term. I mean, Jonathan Allen, Terry McLaurin, now Deron Payne. You gotta love that. Deron Payne, eleven and a half sacks last year, right? Or eleven sacks. He's just he's just an alpha dog and he's jacked, and you just want that in your defensive tackle. So I think he's a cool guy. I think he's a nice guy, you know, super pumped. I'm really happy for him because obviously yeah. he's earned this, and we all kind of talked about maybe this being too much money inside of the defensive tackle room. But I like what this move does because it proves that you have a foundation in place with Deron Payne and Jonathan Allen in the middle of your defense that you feel really, really good about. And so that's why I really like this move. And also because it does a lot with the cap hit. Before we were looking at, what, $20 million? And now it's it's changed because his cap hit for this year is 2.3, which saved about $10 million in cap space this year for Washington, which is great because that's what we really needed, right? So going into today, it was about $24 million. But now we are rejoined. We are now joined by our guest, Mr. Sam Fortier of the Washington Post. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, Sam. How are you doing? I'm, uh, I'm doing all right. How are you guys? I uh, cannot complain, but, Sam. Cannot complain What kind of all. deals do we have under the table right now, Sam? Tell us. <laughs> Who are we uh, signing? Man, if, if, I, if I had any more deals to report, I would, I would, uh, I would have put them out. Well, yeah, yeah come exactly. On. Well, just and tell us who's texting have, you. Might he would have prolonged how, when coming on this podcast as well if they had signed any more people. But to start this off, Sam, I got to get your immediate reaction to Deron Payne's contract and what this ultimately did for Washington in order to make these moves today. Yeah, so I mean, I was I was kind of surprised by the Deron Payne deal. Honestly, I did not think um, that they were going to be able to get a long term extension done. I know they talked about it. Um, but to see it actually come through, to see them, you know, pretty much beat every defensive tackle, but Aaron Donald in the contract department was impressive for Duran. It's good for them. Uh, I, I don't think it makes it impossible for them to keep Montez Sweat and Chase Young, but I think it's going to be really difficult. I think you're going to have to pick one of those guys. Um, and so I, I don't think that it made a ton of difference in what they do today. Because, I mean, they had plenty of cap space, 16-ish million. You know, that's a top 12 rate in the NFL. Like, it wasn't like they were the Saints and, like, hurting for cap right. room and having to restructure dudes um, left and right. But, obviously, you know, it, it helps. Um, and we're still seeing some of these deals come in, um, you know, up to 18 over three for, for Nick Gates, 24 up, up to 24 over three for Andrew Wiley. Um, Cody Barton, the, the former Seahawks linebacker, just signed. We're waiting on the terms for that. So, uh I don't think that any of those guys would not have been pursued or signed um, had you not seen Deron Payne get the deal done. Right. Yeah, definitely. Um, and of the guys you just named, obviously, um, I know a lot of people are like kind of like wanted like the big splash name. They wanted like the the big signing, the big dollars to go to a big player. But I think they got a lot of like solid players that are going to uh, be impactful going into next season for sure. Who do you think is like the most important of these guys that have been signed so far? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> excuse me, I would have to say Andrew Wiley because he's the only one that I'm very confident will be a starter. Like Nick Gates, I think they see as Wes Schweitzer, you can kind of go through and like right. look at the deals, look at the age, look at like there's so many like parallels there. Um, and Cody Barton, like I'm not exact. I, like some people are, are speculating that like he's going to replace Cole Holcomb. I don't know if that's necessarily true. I want to see the terms on this first. Um, although he did obviously break out with that Seahawks young defense. But the reason I say Andrew Wiley is Eric Bienemy knows exactly what he's getting. Um, whether he plays guard or tackle, like he is a starting caliber offensive lineman, which I don't know that you can 100% sure say about Nick Gates. Um, 
And so I think that like he's going to be the contributor on the field if everything goes right for the majority of the snaps this season. Right. And then, Sam, the move with Nick Gates, do you think that this has any implications or uh, ramifications with Chase Rouye, who has a high cap number this year, who whose future is in doubt? Yeah, great question. Like, I expected them to either cut him or restructure him, you know, because he has a $12 million cap hit this year. Like, that's pretty high for a guy that hasn't been able to stay on the field in the last two years. Does that mean anything for Chase Rouye immediately? No, I don't think so. Like, I okay. think that um, I, I don't anticipate – you know, them making big moves because I think they would have done it prior to free agency. Okay. Uh, this is not a move like, like I don't know if you guys remember, but Matt Ioannidis last year, right. they cut him during free agency, I believe on the second or third day, and his agents came out and were pretty pissed, like going on the record in the Associated Press to say like Washington screwed us, basically. I don't anticipate that happening with Chase Roulier this year. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I was going to ask you about Cody Barton, but you kind of already – if he's going to replace Cole Holcomb, but Hey, you, you know, you had to elaborate and you took my question. So uh, is there anybody else? To, uh, go ahead. Just like if this deal comes in and it's like one or two years for four to 6 million APY, like then maybe, yeah, like that's a Cole Holcomb replacement, but it's, I just did not expect, I don't expect him to have commanded that sort of market. It, it's a right. one year, thing and obviously the Seahawks were super young on defense last year playing a bunch of young DBs um and, and having a tough time on that defensive line so I mean maybe they view him that way but I would be I would be kind of surprised if this were the answer especially considering like how deep this linebacker market was like I expected mm -hmm. them to take a look at because you're white you know the, the guy out of San Francisco like there were plenty of options you know Bobby Okariki was like my dream top of the second tier guy that they would go after but um that's kind of where I'm at in terms of the linebacker market right now. Well, okay. So for Andrew Wiley, do you think, I know he's played guard his entire career. He, he played right tackle last year. He played it very well, especially in the Super Bowl. But do you think that this means that he's going to play right tackle? Cosmo's going to slide inside the guard or how do you think that they're viewing him? Great, great question. Like that is something that I'm trying to get clarity on right now too, because obviously he played right tackle last year, but I think that was more out of necessity. It seems right. like um, Brandon Thorne, who I think does an amazing job at, at NFL O-line analysis um, uh, does some stuff with Duke Miniweather. Um, he sees Andrew Wiley as more of a guard and I, and I tend to, to trust uh, Brandon's read. But again, like this is something that we're going to have to talk to Ron about Martin Mayhew, Eric B where do they see these guys? But I do see Sam and Andrew as sort of similar guys, um, especially with the positional flexibility. And I would imagine those two in some combination are on the right side um, come September. And now, right. Sam, can you kind of tell us what one player got re-signed today that kind of went under the radar and Danny Johnson, who really performed well on the outside last year. Two seasons ago, he really made a name for himself as a kind of like the box kind of safety in the Landon Collins kind of Buffalo nickel role. Last season, he took a big step on the outside. Tell us about his new contract and how, how this coaching staff feels about Danny Johnson. Yeah, this was a surprisingly good deal for him. You know, two two years at $7.5 uh, He's getting, you know, I, I, I believe it's 2.75 guaranteed, which is more than he's almost as much as he's made throughout his entire career, which is his career earnings in six years in the NFL is, is 3.3 million. So uh, this is a, a really strong contract for him. I don't know if you're going to see him as like the number three corner in there with, with Benjamin St. Juice and Kendall Fuller. Uh, but I think that, you know, this is a promising depth piece for Washington. And I tweeted out this clip, but like one of my favorite uh, moments from last year uh, particularly down the stretch, there were not very good moments down the stretch, uh, very many good moments, but there was a third and seven near midfield when Washington was trailing by seven at New York uh, the first time they played the Giants. And Jack Del Rio calls a corner blitz, and, and from the slot, Danny Johnson sacks Daniel Jones to push them out of field goal range and set up you know, the game-tying drive. Obviously, they, they ended up tying, but it was just, you know, they had benched Christian Holmes and put Danny Johnson in in the second half, and so for him to kind of come out bend off the fire that the Giants were throwing his way and then go make a huge play on a blitz. You just, he's like, he's kind of like Jeremy Reeves in the sense that like this dude has just been grinding it out at the right, bottom of right. rosters forever. And now he's like got a, you know, a good, decent foothold in the league. And you're always happy for guys like that. Yeah, definitely. Definitely happy for a guy like that. Like you said, just been grinding it out for years and finally getting a, a little bit of shine and a little bit of a, I guess a bigger payday. But, um, now that they've made a couple moves in free agency, um, I know a lot of the speculation was they were going to go offensive line in the draft, maybe cornerback in the draft. 
they've kind of not really sh- like sure those spots up, but they've added some pieces there. What do you think? Obviously, the draft is still a couple of weeks away or a month away. So, but what do you think their plan is? You think their plan has changed going forward, or you think that they're going bless? They can go best player available now. The draft is six weeks away. Don't because <laughs> <don't laughs> <rush me. laughs> uh, because I'm. It's interesting. I think we're a little too early in free agency to tell. I think that them going after two linemen sort of takes the pressure off to go offensive line in the first round. You can go corner if if Christian Gonzalez or Joey Porter, or, you know, Devin Witherspoon falls to you. Like, I think you would take a long look at those guys. But the same is true of of you know the Georgia tackle or or either of the Ohio State tackles. And Dewan Jones is probably more of a day two, but you know, or, or Skaronsky from Northwestern, like you have options now. Um, and I think that that is, that is to me sort of the Nick Gates signing. Cause like Nick Gates, if you need him to, I think he can start at guard and I think he can be solid. But like, if you're sitting at 16 and all those three corners are gone and the top tackles are gone, are you like, all right, like maybe it's Osiris Torrance here, the Florida guard, like, it just gives you options, and I think that's really what you're seeing them set up here. And I've heard that, uh, like, the Giants fans are kind of flipping out about Nick Gates leaving. I've heard that it was like the Taylor Heineke of them. I, I mean, he it seems like he suffered the Alex Smith leg injury at yep. Washington week two of the 2021 season. I, I was at that game. I remember, like, that was a scary injury. And kind of going back and reading today, you seven know. Seven like, surgeries. Seven surgeries is insane. It is, yeah. Um, and, and to have him come back and, and – you know, seems seemed to make a full recovery. I remember watching him on tape, like after the two commanders games against them. And like the dude seems to, to have come back in, in a solid fashion. So, you know, props to him for sure. And Kyle also, had to have seven surgeries for his transition. Oh, no, That's crazy. <laughs> now to, to wrap this up, Sam, I only have a couple more questions for you, but on, let's just say on a crazy meter, zero to 10, um, because some zero have, to Daniel Jones contract, some, some have speculated <laughs> that the, Contract extension for Deron Payne is an implication that possibly the sale has moved forward. We've got clarification on the crazy meter from zero to ten. How uh, how how much how crazy is that? Uh, I would say that the Deron Payne extension being a secret indicator for the sale being done is is probably like a seven. Okay. There's been a lot. There's been a lot of crazy it's stuff. Actually, higher than I thought you were here. gonna say. <laughs> yeah. uh, I mean, like, you know. Like, I remember that New York Post story that was like, you know, uh, Bezos will sell the post to get the commanders to appease Dan. That that was pretty high up on the crazy meter, too. Um, I mean, those two things might happen, but it would be independent of each other. So, man, I really hope the sale gets done soon so we can stop talking about it. For sure. I, I'm right there with you, Sam. I cannot wait. It's just like the name change. I cannot wait for this to be over at this point. But my next question for you, uh, Kent Johansson from Rigo's Rag kind of floated the theory out there that wa- there's rumors that Washington is heavily interested in Austin Eckler, the running back from the Chargers. Have you heard anything about that? Yeah, so I also saw that tweet, and then I went through and tried to figure out, like, who the rumors he was talking about was. And if you guys have, like, further insight there, I'd be curious to know, but I, I saw like one other like guy on Twitter speculated it, but I didn't, I mean, like w- what were the origins of those rumors? Right. And that's the question that I would like to know as well, Bob. Oh, I'm, okay. Like, I, I was wondering if you guys, I was legit. Like, do you guys know? No, 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 no. no. I wish <laughs> I didn't know anything I wish over I did, here. Sam. That's why yeah. we have we're, you we're in the dark over here, just like everyone else. Um, but that just, just real quick. Like, that's not something that I have heard, you know, maybe, maybe, you know, that okay. is happening, but if so, like, that, that would be surprising to me. Okay, I got you. Um, and now my last question for you before we wrap this up, do you expect any big name move at all? No, I, I don't think that going into free agency, Washington was ever going to make a big name move. Like I would be stunned if they were in on Orlando Brown or, you know, obviously one of the top linebackers, Tremaine Mendens and, and TJ Edwards already off the board. But like I would be – this is that's just not how they I think were going to play it. They were going to be in that second tier, kind of like what you've seen so far, right? Like, yeah. um, this is where they were pretty much always going to be, and I think that's more of a, a philosophical thing, honestly. Uh, than a, I, I, I was suspecting, I was curious if this was going to be because of the potential sale. Are you limited in the amount of cash that you can spend? Obviously, the Duran Payne deal um, suggests that that you can spend just fine. Um, but I think this is more of a philosophical approach uh, for them in free agency. I got you. Sam, would you have signed you'd... Daniel Jones to a four-year $160 million deal? <laughs> would I have done that? No. Uh, <laughs> I, think, like, I, I think like this is a really interesting question about like, 
what do you pay for in the quarterback market, right? Like, right. And, and touchdowns I think to, get you 160 mil, baby. I mean, Daniel Jones to me is like not that far away from Kirk Cousins, and I've always felt that like, or or, or Jared Goff when the Rams signed him initially, That's like fair. when you yeah. pay top tier money for for not top tier production, like yeah. you're you're stuck in purgatory. Like, yeah. Yeah. and this is sort of a just to kind of like go off the top. I was having this argument with my roommates last night. Like we were talking about, okay, now that the Panthers went up to one, like would you prefer to have a guy with a maybe a little bit lower ceiling, but you have a higher confidence that he's going to hit his ceiling in Bryce Young, or do you just take the home run swing on Anthony Richardson? And like the comp for Anthony Richardson being Josh Allen, like there's only one Josh Allen, only one dude yeah. has had crazy tools and then like actually translated. Right. Whereas like, yeah, Zach, you've Wilson, seen that before. Jamarcus like, Russell, all these right. guys, all, yeah. all those dudes that were like, that are not, uh, that, that have not made that transition, like, is that is Josh Allen replicable? And I think that there's like plenty of good arguments on both sides, but am I going to pay top tier market for a guy that, uh, where, where the, the best part of the Giants game the plan commanders. last year, yeah. the best part of the Giants game plan last year was taking the ball out of his hands yeah. and having him run. You're right. Yeah. Like the dude can throw the ball, don't get me wrong, but like he's not going to win true drop back passing. He's got it. And that's what you pay for. You're absolutely right, Sam. You're absolutely right. Sam, I can't thank you enough, brother. I know it's been a crazy day. I'm sure you have a lot to get to. Hopefully we get some more news come down the pipeline. Sir, I can't thank you enough for joining us. Hope you have a good night. Of course, guys. Uh, Thanks so much. Thanks, Sam. Have a good night, brother. I appreciate you. you. Yeah. I, I appreciate him for joining us and being able to keep up with Reed's questions because sometimes it's just too much. But I just want to put this out there that Nick Gates – Nick Gates is a three-year, $16.5 million deal. He's 27 years old. He had nine. He has had nine penalties in his entire career in 29 games started and 44 games played. Now we are joined by our next guest, Mr. Kent LaPlette. How are you doing, brother? The creator of the RAS, the Relative Athlete Score. How are you doing tonight? Doing fantastic, man. Glad to be back on with you guys. Yes, sir. And a lot of news has come about with free agency with the Washington Commanders and the NFL altogether, Kent. But we got to bring this back to the draft, brother. And uh, I know that, that Washington has done a lot to their offensive line up until this point, but I want to get your opinion on the, the RAS scores for a lot of these guys in the offensive line, the top tiers that Washington could possibly still be able to draft in the first round. Yeah, so the offensive tackle class did better than the interior linemen at the draft. A lot of the guys that were hyped to do well did well. Um, a couple of guys that were hyped to do well only tested in a few things. Uh, Paris Johnson was a guy that only did a couple of the drills. He did well in what he did, uh, but he didn't finish testing enough to get a score. The interior of the offensive line was a little bit of a different story. A couple of the highly rated guys didn't really test all that well, specifically speaking of Osiris Torrance and John Michael Schmitz, um, who's a guard and a center, respectively. Um, those guys had a bit of a disappointing combine. You kind of expect them to test a little bit better than that. Uh, but we did get a lot of guys that people didn't really weren't really paying all that much attention to coming into the combine that I think they came away a little bit more impressed with in terms of testing. John Gaines from UCLA mm. uh, tested the highest of all the interior offensive linemen. Um, City Sow from Eastern Michigan, which is a great name also, but mm-hmm. also tested very, very well. So it isn't, it isn't bereft of talent from just because a couple of guys tested poorly. But I think you're going to see a little bit of different rankings for the guards and the centers now that the combine combine's kind of in the rear rear view mirror. Okay. Right. One person that really impressed me and I, I, I he was on a Dane Brugler who does the freaks list uh during the offseason. I'm pretty sure it's Dane Brugler who does that. Yeah. Um Zach Koontz, the tight end, what what was he what was that like? I mean he kind of tested where I expected. I just didn't expect it to be like that high up on like the all time ranks. Yeah, so we had uh, the the t- number one spot for Raz for tight ends was actually picked up last year by Jelani Woods. That had held since, I yeah. think, 2004 or something like that. It had been a very long time since anybody had broken that. And then Zach Koontz comes in here and breaks it the following year. Um, it's a pretty it's going to be a pretty tough one to beat, too. You're talking a guy that's six foot seven and three eighths. He had a 40 inch vertical and a 10 eight broad. Both of those are 99th, 98th percentile. Uh, and then he goes out and does the agility drills. Now he's very tall and guys who are very tall tend to struggle with the agility drills. You have a lot of balance that you have to pay attention to during those drills. Um, he put a four, 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 12, uh, shuttle time and a six eighty seven cone, which is 96th and 95th percentile for a tight end at that size, which is just crazy. And then he runs a four, five, five. 
<laughs> Jesus Christ. I, I don't know if, if he's he has some, some football talent, obviously, but it, he's he's not a guy that people were really talking up all that much coming into the comment, other than just being a great athlete. Now that people see the level of athlete that he is, I think you're going to start to see him go a little bit earlier in a lot of mock drafts. You're going to see people talking about him a bit more. Um, there's a lot of talent. ODU doesn't get a whole lot of a lot of hype. They don't get a whole lot of play in the national media. Uh, but with that kind of athleticism, you got to think teams took notice. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I, when I was watching, I just happened to flip on the combine when the defensive linemen were doing their like combines and whatnot, or their forty yard dash. And it was up on Nolan Smith, and I just happened to glance up, and I was just like, in shock, like, whoa, he just blew down there, down the down the line. Um, what was his RAS score, and is that, is, was it comparable to any other RAS scores throughout the the past couple of years? Yeah, the big thing with Nolan Smith is that he's he's very slender for an edge rusher. He only came in at 238 pounds. We have seen a couple of guys come out that were a little bit more slender that have found some success, but that's really tough in the NFL. Even in a, in a, a three, four pass rushing linebacker role, those guys tend to be a little bit bigger than that. Uh, but you also don't have defensive linemen who run a four, three, nine either. That doesn't happen generally. Um, I always bring up when I'm talking about Raz about the difference between uh, a four, five, five at, you know, a wide receiver position versus the defensive end position. It's always like, yeah, it's okay for a wide receiver, but for a defensive end, that's phenomenal. And this dude ran a four, three, nine. Like, I don't even use that as an example. It's so absurd. <laughs> um, and then, of course, you had a 41 and a half inch vertical and a 10 8 broad, both of which are 99th, 98th percentile scores. So, very, very explosive, very fast. Uh, the big question is just going to be size and durability. And if he can check those boxes, I, I guarantee the teams are going to take notice of him. He was already being talked about as a relatively early um, draftee, probably not a first rounder, but early day two. He might have got himself into that first round conversation with that kind of a run. Uh, but I don't expect him to be on the board all that long. Actually, and Ken, you know, I'm a very selfish person, so we got to bring this back to the commanders. You know, we love the draft, of course. But Washington signed Andrew Wiley, and you have some sort of connection with Andrew Wiley. So I was hoping that maybe you could give us a glimpse, your thoughts on who Andrew Wiley is as a player and also as a person. Yeah, I don't I, I don't know Wiley personally. Uh, no, no, his, no. his cousin works with me, and I've, I've talked about him quite a bit. Um, you can imagine a lot of people talk to me about football when I'm at the office. Mm -hmm. right? um, and his, his cousin happens to work with me. Um, this is a guy that was su supremely athletic when he came out. He had a 9.04 RAS, um, extremely well, well tested. Uh, his explosion girls were 97th and 98th percentile, so extremely wow. explosive, explosive player. Um, and whenever we talk about him, it's always about just the stuff that they're doing. He seems like a pretty good kid, has a really good head on his shoulders. Um, I've never heard him talk about anything that would raise any red flags. Um, but it, it uh, the first conversation that we had was just me talking about how athletic the dude was. And it was nice to be the guy that's talking about somebody else rather than being the guy talking mm -hmm. to him about football stuff when I'm at the office. Um, very talented player coming out of Eastern Michigan. Eastern Michigan has actually been pretty good at getting offensive linemen right. into the NFL. It's, yeah. it's, it's not a factory, like you'd say, but they've, they've had a pretty good run of offensive linemen in the NFL. Um, and Wiley wasn't exactly an early round pick, and he's still still kicking it in the NFL. Very good pickup. He's, he's going to be very good for you guys, I think. Yeah, and last yeah. year he uh, PFF graded him as 63.1. Um, in that Super Bowl, he was obviously very, very good, but allowed nine sacks. That's something a lot of people have talked about, but like Reed had brought up before, a lot of people have – speculated the fact that you know Patrick Mahomes running outside of the pocket probably has a lot to do with that sorry Reed oh <laughs> yep uh oops let me find my question here Deontay Banks uh the cornerback from Maryland both cornerbacks from Maryland ran really well but what did you see from him I know the commanders are really going to probably be in in the market for a corner and how did it stack up against somebody like a uh, Christian Gonzalez yeah Deontay Banks actually had the highest res of any cornerback at the combine he ran a four three five both of his explosion drills were 99th percentile, almost the best ever. Um, he has one of the highest combined uh, explosion scores of any player in combine history. Damn. So it's he's a very explosive player, very fast, has all that athleticism. He was already kind of rising up in draft boards, I believe, before the combine. I started seeing him in first round mocks a couple of weeks before that. Um, my other duties, I run the the mock, mock draft simulator for Pro Football Network. So I by the way, attention. is the best one. It is the best one. It's better than PFFs. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, but I have to pay attention to, you know, player rankings nationally and consensus and stuff like that just to make sure that we don't fall behind what other people are seeing in players. And he was already kind of rising up. 
I think when when he had his combine, he pretty much cemented himself as either a late first round selection or at worst an early second round guy. Um, he compares va- very favorably to Byron Jones and Marshawn Lattimore. Both players have become pretty good in the league. Um, I don't think Byron Jones, so I, I mentioned that he has one of the best combined explosion scores of any player ever. Um, I don't think anybody's ever going to beat Byron Jones. He had a, a Long world, jump, right? world record broad yeah. jump and a 44 and a half inch vertical. Um, but Banks was almost there. I mean, he had he had 42 inches and 11 four. That's that's pretty darn good. So yeah. um, very, very explosive player. Very fast. Um, if you're running a scheme that requires a guy to be in man a lot, he's going to do pretty well in that scheme because he can run with anybody and he can change direction so fast because he's so explosive. Right. Yeah, now, Ken, real quick, um, Washington claimed Cam Dantzler, um, who was waived by the Minnesota Vikings, who came out in the 2020 draft, somebody I liked coming out of that draft. If you could, real quick, what was his RAS? He didn't have a very good RAS. He only had a RAS of 3.03. He tested pretty poorly. I understand there was some kind of an injury issue coming into it. I could never find any any reliable information about it. It's always okay. tough when you have uh, guys that are injured around their testing because anytime somebody tests poorly – well, they had a bad hamstring, right? It's the, <laughs> it's the, the dog ate my homework of, yeah. of football testing. Um, but considering the way that he plays, I think there's some validity to that. He probably didn't, he probably wouldn't have tested as poorly as he did had he been fully healthy. Um, but I, I don't record asterisks next to the numbers. I, I try to make sure that I keep the context of what they actually tested. And he did test pretty poorly when he came out. I got you. Now, Kent, to wrap this up, I only have a couple more questions. Um, but one of my favorite cornerbacks in this draft is Christian Gonzalez, and after that is Devin Witherspoon. Do you have any Raz comps for them for their testing numbers? Yeah, Christian Gonzalez is fantastic, and another guy that I, I can go through the same thing I just said with Deontay Banks. Just same thing, pretty much the same, just a little bit bigger, <laughs> little little bit bigger. It's all the same stuff for him. Um, he comps very favorably favorably to. Deontay Banks, coincidentally, uh, but also Jalen Ramsey. And I think that's the level of athlete that you're talking about here with Christian Gonzalez. Um, he's a little bit taller, like barely taller than than uh, Ramsey was. He's a little bit lighter. I think he's like 10 pounds lighter. Uh, but same bench, a little bit faster in the 40-yard dash, uh, same vertical, almost exactly the same broad. The, athletically, they are very, very similar players. So the level of athlete you're talking about here is a Jalen Ramsey type. Wow, I'd love to hear that, man. I'm sorry, you got me lost for words. Uh, <laughs> uh, but real quick, the last question I have for you, linebackers, who stood out the most? Uh, let, let, let's not do the edge, guys, but let's just say predominantly your Mike linebackers. Who ha- who stood out in the Raz? Yeah, Jack Campbell was a guy that came into the combine with a lot of questions about whether or not he was going to test all that well. Um, he was one of those guys that I get every year where it's like, I feel like I'm taking crazy pills because everyone's talking about these guys like they're going to test poorly. And I'm like, where? Where are you seeing right. that on tape, right? Um, Campbell put up a 9.98 rest at the combine, which I, I think is answering those questions. Wow. Um, he tested in everything but the bench, and he did well in almost every single drill. He ran a 4 6 5, 40. Uh, which is not bad. That's not in elite territory, but it's almost in elite territory. Um, he had uh, 82nd percentile, 98th percentile shuttle and cone, and over 90th percentile for both of his explosion drills. And this is a guy who's almost 250 pounds, and he's six four and a half. This isn't a small linebacker. He's a bigger guy, and he can move. He's very, very explosive. Um, it's, it's a really good strength strength and conditioning program they have at Iowa. They, these guys are very well prepared coming into the combine and for their pro days. Uh, but even with that level of preparation, he showed a lot of that athleticism on field. And I think he's probably pushed himself into that late first round consideration. If not, if not there, I don't see him lasting long in the second round. Is there a player comp that you have for him readily available? Yeah, he comps very similarly to uh, TJ Watt and Leighton Van Der Esch. So depending okay. on what you want to do with him, You've got a little bit of options there because athletically he's almost identical to Leighton Van Der Esch. Uh, you can actually pull up a comparison right beneath every player card now at Raz.Football. Um, there's a, a player comparison. It'll show you the closest comparisons that we were able to find in the database. And if you click on that player's name, it'll pull up a side by side, and you can view side by side what these guys tested. Um, six four and a half, pretty much the same height as Van Der Esch, almost exactly the same weight, ran exactly the same forty yard dash. They both ran a better 10-yard split than they did their dash time. 
Um, almost the same explosion drills, almost the same uh, agility drills. The guys are extremely similar athletically. So if you're looking for a comparison for an off-ball linebacker, it would be Leighton Van Der Esch. And I think their play style isn't too dissimilar. Either. Yeah, I was about to no, say that's actually pretty good. All. Yeah, Kent, before you get out of here, just real quick, if you just like to plug your social media handle and all your Raz stuff so anybody that is willing that wants to come find all that info that you willingly so provide that they can be able to do that. Yeah, man, you can find all of my data at ras.football. Um, it's all available there. We have about 23,000 players now in the database. Wow. Um, it grows every year. Um, you can look at those players' scores. As I just mentioned, you can check the comparisons beneath the cards. We have the ability to change players' position right beneath the cards. There's the option to uh, run a calculator for a player. So if they didn't test in something and you want to see what their score would have been, you can do that on every single player card. Um, you can also find my coding work over at uh, profootballnetwork.com slash mock draft. I run the mock draft simulator there. Um, you can always check me out on Twitter at Math Bomb. I love talking football. Um, I, I, I was originally a Lions fan, still am, uh, but primarily I cover the draft now, and it doesn't really matter what team you follow. If you're talking football, I'll talk football with you. I, I love that stuff. Um, so, yeah, check me out any of those places. And that's why you fit right in with us. Okay. I can't <laughs> it's, thank you enough. It's crazy, too, how much the Raz score has blown up over the years, like over the last couple of years. Like, the Raz, like they use that for everything now. Like, he's, yeah, he's got a good rest score. Great job. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's it's been a lot of fun and hopefully it keeps getting better. I, I can't give any spoilers, but I will have some some announcements hopefully at the end of the month, if not mid-April, about some of the stuff that we're looking forward to doing. Uh 2023 was expected to be my big year, and I think 2024 is gonna blow right out of the water. Oh wow. Damn. I'm excited to hear nice. Ken. Hopefully you give us the there details on that. I would love to be able <laughs> to hear them. Ken, I can't thank you enough, brother. Have a good night. Yeah, Thanks, thank guys. You. Appreciate you having me on. Uh, thank Appreciate you, sir. It. Man, it's it's awesome to have be in the same company as royalty as Kent. You know? I know. I love having Kent on because I'm such like a I'm so obsessed with guys' workout and he's fucking dude. The guy is I'm an just, encyclopedia of. I'm just gonna get the same mustache as him, and then I know. Just, and he's got a if I can get mustache. the same mustache as him, I think I'll be like just a one percent cooler. Could you imagine Hall with that mustache? No, that would look sick. That would actually look really cool if he only had that. Which is yeah. funny. I saw my man, uh, see, man. I saw my dad on Saturday. <laughs> and like be a little villain. My dad, like have you ever seen the movie Nacho Libre? Like my have dad w- when my dad had his mustache, he looked just like Nacho Libre. I'm talking like dead center. And his sixtieth birthday is in two weeks, so all of his buddies are coming into town. They're going out golfing. We're having a party for him. And he was like, I'm growing up with the mustache. Uh, for it because he hasn't oh, had the yeah. mustache since he met my mom because she's like i'm not i'm not marrying you with that stash on i can't blame her because you look at nacho libre and you're like eh. but hey uh, jack black looks good he does look good now let's go to our fan questions we have a lot of them and this one is from the colonel he said he woke up to some great news regarding deron Payne. do you anticipate we will be able to keep both sweat and young or we will have to focus on one and let the other walk yeah uh, i th- i think we're gonna have to focus in on one because i mean you look at we got to resign Cam Curl. We got it's going to be tough. And Montez Sweats obviously comes up first, but do you exercise his fifth year option and then sign Chase Young? Chase Young still got a lot to prove. So I don't know. That's tough. I don't think we can keep both of them. No, I don't think so either. Um, but they can make it work. I do like the way that they structured Deron Payne and the way that he's getting paid because it takes the weight off this year. And you know, with Jonathan Allen's contract, obviously, and we talked about this before in the podcast, wanting them to kind of offset those paydays, and they've done a good job of being able to do that. Um, so I, I think that what's going to happen in the future is it's going to be based on play because I think Montez Sweat could have a or Chase Young could have a blowout year this year, like Deron Payne, and that's who they're going to reward. So they're fighting for the same spot, in my personal opinion. What do you think, Hall? Yeah, um, like obviously with the salary cap and, and everyone's like, oh, it's a myth. Like if they wanted to make it work and would keep everybody together, they probably could make it work. But I think they're going to focus on one. I think that, like you said, with Chase Young, um, they have a little bit, kind of a little bit of time left to, to uh, figure out that what they're going to do with that. If they're going to follow the same motto as Jonathan Allen and Deron Payne, They'll probably let Chase Young play out his fifth-year option as well. And if Montez Sweat is going to follow in the same foot, footsteps as Jonathan Allen and Deron Payne, he might explode his fifth year, and then next you know he's getting a deal next year. And by that point, it's probably not looking good for Chase coming back on a second contract. But, yeah, long story short, if they wanted to make it work, they could. But 
they're probably more than likely just going to focus on one guy and lock in three out of the four guys. Yeah, now or, let's look at look at what the Dolphins did with Tyreek Hill. How legal is that, by the way? They converted most of his salary into a signing bonus. Yeah, so like, it doesn't count cash. that much against the guy. Yeah, exactly. That's sick. It, it's that's just nice. disgusting using that way of cash. But look, if you have it, you got it. Um, now this next question, Hall from the Colonel, could you comment briefly on the right tackle Andrew Wiley, who we just signed? Yeah, um, like we went through uh, his PFF grades a little bit earlier in the in the in the show. Uh, played with the Chiefs last year, obviously Super Bowl champion. Eric Bieniemy, Eric Bieniemy knows him well. They drafted him in 2018, which is the same year that Eric Bieniemy, Bieniemy came Bieniemy. became the offense. Yeah, I know I can't talk today. Eric Bieniemy became the offensive coordinator, so he's been with uh, Bieniemy since day one that he's been drafted. They know each other really well. Uh, I saw a couple of the reporters saying that Andrew Wiley was speaking really highly of him, and likewise with uh, Eric Bieniemy. So I think that uh, and then it was obviously speculated that a lot of people wanted him to go after Orlando Brown, but I think a lot of the uh, the people within the know were expecting that Wiley was uh, going to be the guy to come over from Kansas City. So definitely uh, helps out the right side of the line. There's a lot of flexibility on the right side with him being a right tackle or a right guard. Cosme obviously is a right guard, right guard, or he can push God. him out to right tackle as well. He's I, know, I don't know what's wrong with me today. He's mm-hmm. God. He's God. But uh, yeah, so um, yeah, I think it's a solid pickup. And the offensive line is about getting your five best linemen on the field, and he's one of those five. So I'm uh, excited about the pickup. Yeah, he's six six, three hundred and ten pounds. He started fifty nine games in his career at guard and tackle. Has given up twenty two penalties overall in his career in 2018 he played right guard according to pro football reference in 2019 left guard 2020 right guard 2021 right tackle and then 2022 he was considered a guard but we all know he played predominantly right tackle even though that's what pro football reference has him in there and the three year 24 million dollars so roughly about 7 million per and then he's 28 years old he had eight penalties this year. He had gave up nine sacks, which is tied for third most, which is not great. But he had over a thousand snaps, dude. Playing for the Chiefs, who Pat Mahomes, who likes to scramble, that's gonna happen. But look, this is somebody bringing in stability, and I think the big question is where does Eric Bieniemy feel comfortable with Andrew Wiley? Obviously, he's a swing type of way because he's played all over the line. So my question is, are they looking at him for the seven million per? Are they looking at him at right tackle or are they looking at him at guard? And I feel like that's the big question moving forward. Yeah, uh, you guys basically touched on everything, but uh, I just think that it's a it really shows that this whole Eric B enemy players don't like Eric B enemy thing. I really don't think that that he followed him from a Super Bowl winning team over here to the commanders because he likes Eric B enemy and he respects what he does. So I just think that's, that's probably a huge part of it. And that's going to be an overlooked. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, right now it looks like Cody Barton had a 63.7 PFF grade. I've seen some uh, Seahawks fans saying that he's a very good coverage linebacker, which is good to hear because that's exactly what Washington has been looking forward to, right? But let's go to our fan questions. And this one is from Orange Crush 92 Reed, he, uh, he says, I want to know if Gibby's turf toe is still affecting his quality of play. He was looking better last year, but that couldn't that could have been due to the lesser load provided by Brian Robinson. Yeah, and I think that kind of goes into everybody being excited about Brian Robinson kind of taking a majority of the carries and him kind of moving into a different role because that turf toe thing, man, that lingers. That can stay around for a while. And look, I'm a huge feet guy. I love feet. Okay. <laughs> There's nothing like I like more. Guy. I'm just kidding. I fucking you and Rex feet. Ryan. Yeah. yeah I hate sounds feet. about That's right. So disgusting. I People that like feet, ew, you know. Uh, but I, I do think that that probably did play a big part. I mean, we didn't hear much about it, but. It's got to be hurting him, you know, and I don't want to see it. I don't want to yeah. see turf growing on his toe because that's what that is, right? I, I definitely think that his turf toe affected his quality of play throughout the year, and that's kind of why you saw them kind of forcing Brian Robinson more and more. I know there was one picture of him getting on the team plane at one point where he played that week and he got on the team plane with a boot on. Uh, so obviously he was going through something. I did I did think it affected his explosion a little bit because where was that explosion you saw against the Jags? Remember when he runs at one corner route, he catches the ball over the DB? Like that kind of explosion, we never really saw that from AG. And I'm not sure if this is going directly correlated to the, to the turf toe, but I feel like Gibby does deserve the respect because he worked on his fumbles. He didn't give up that many this year. But I do think that going forward, especially for a running back, because you always hear – when you get injured, you're never 100% ever again. 
and I do wonder how much that toe does affect things because I've had a broken toe, a uh, fractured toe before, and it is not fun, dude. Not fun at all. Yeah, um, he's been having like toe and foot problems since uh, his rookie year. It's kind of just been like an ongoing thing. So, um, hopefully, he gets it worked out. I think like I do think that Brian Robinson coming in and lessening the load for him definitely helped out a little bit. Um, like you said, after week one, when we saw him kind of go off in the passing game, I think we were all kind of excited, like, okay, this is going to be Gibson's new role. This is what we all expected from him. This is what we wanted to see. And it kind of never really got back to that, the height of week one yeah. um, for Gibson. But I do think with Eric Vandermeer coming in, if you remember back to the Chiefs before Kareem Hunt decided to uh, kick a girl in the face at a hotel lobby, he was a guy that was uh, really essential in the passing game as well. And uh, he was coming out the backfield, running wheel routes, running flat routes. Yep circling out the motion, running out the slot. So, obviously, with Gibson playing receiver in college, being active in the passing game, I think that uh, we might finally see the – what everyone thought Gibson was going to turn out to be after his rookie year because, obviously, after his rookie year, 10 touchdowns total. Everyone was like, the sky's the limit for this guy. And it's kind of tailed off. It's not been as consistent. But I do think that uh, Eric Bieniemy is going to get him maybe close back to his rookie year. Yeah, when Ken put out that tweet about the Austin Eckler rumor with the Commanders, you know, I'm not saying to go out and do it, but the thought of having Eric Bieniemy with Austin Eckler, it just makes you salivate. Just I mean, thinking yeah. about the fact Anybody that this, one Austin this guy, Eckler. yeah, he had 18 touchdowns by himself in Washington last year, 24 altogether. So it yeah, just kind of shows just don't you, see it, yeah, but. like wh- how he could help you in that, and that's why I'd be. He's such a about. good all-around back. Right. Yeah. And now, Reed, this next question is from a joker to see our guy in the Discord chat server. Appreciate you, brother. With approximately $9.5 million in cap space saved with a pain contract, what do you think is the best move moving forward now? Resign our own, like Curl, extending him, or Reeves, or fill a need, i.e. offensive line or linebacker? Yeah, I mean, obviously you always want to uh, fill some needs, but you got to take care of your own, man. I, I really want to see Cam Curl – get get some done sooner rather than later i don't want him to hit the market i do think that like i know like according to fans and like the media and, and stuff uh or other fans and media it's probably not as well respected around the league as he should be but i do think nfl coaches gms and players and stuff they know how good cam curl is because they see him every week they, they know what they're doing and i don't want him to hit that because i have a feeling one of those some of those people are gonna make this guy gets a big contract yeah and i think jesse Bates Which, signing shout out to him he deserves jesse it, Bates but. signing the contract today with the falcons um, getting $16 million per season is very good for Cameron Curl. That means that that's where he's going to be a roundabout, and it gives you a good meter in being able to offer Cam Curl contract. So, yes, Joker, for me, it's re-signing Cam Curl and then also getting Jeremy Reeves as well. Obviously, him going to his first Pro Bowl, uh, All-Pro Revo as well. So, obviously, you want to be able to bring him back because he's key to special teams and to this locker room. But I feel like Cameron Curl is in that position where you don't want it to get to the situation with Deron Payne. You want to take care of it now. And as if you're spending money now, let's take care of it, man. Let's bring the dude back. I don't want to have to deal with this from the safety position because the safety position has been one we have not been able to fix until Cam Curl walk came around. And so I don't I want to I don't want to have that problem uh, surface again. Yeah, um, I mean, you heard Deron Payne in uh, little press clippings came out, or if you watched the video on Twitter, yeah, I where it. he was like he's excited and he wanted to do the deal because this is the team that drafted him. They watched him grow as a player, and it's like they rewarded him for the work that he's put in and the work he's put on the field and off the field and how much he's grown as a player. And I feel like that's exactly the same as Cam Curl. They drafted him in the seventh round, diamond in the rough, came in, had a crazy, crazy rookie year. He's been an impact player for us ever since. You've seen what the defense looks like. Like you've seen the numbers last year when he was off the field and when he was returned from the field, returned to the field, and then when he was off the field again. You just saw how how night and day the defense was. Right. And so I just think that uh obviously, like you said, around the league, he's not really a like a, a household name because I mean if we're winning like 10 plus games, I think he would be a household name. But he's definitely one of those guys that I think that other coaches and GMs around the league that are like, that's a solid player. That's a, a legit NFL safety. And given the chance, I think that a lot of teams would sign him in free agency. So it's definitely essential that they get him locked up. And like you said, Ron's created the culture of 
signing guys and keeping your own and keeping your core players. And I do think that Cam Curl is definitely one of those core players. Yeah, and the one thing I, I you know, I've heard people talk about um, Cam Curl's um, open market value and that not many teams would covet his ability. And the one thing I keep going back to is why do I keep yawning? Jesus. Look at the look at the the, the you, change Kyle. the change to the linebackers where it's going to speed right and let, Cam Curl fits that bill. That's exactly what defensive coordinators are looking at. So I, I find that laughable. But this next question is from Andy Lockhart in the Discord chat server hall. Oi. Do you, think, do you think Allen will now Oy. get jealous that Duran is getting paid more than him, a face of the franchise kind of guy, et cetera? No, nah, I don't think so. I mean, I know that is probably like a thing in the NFL as far as like egos go. Like guys are looking at other guys like I'm better than you. Why are you getting paid more than me? But I'm, I'm sure that Jonathan Allen, is a, he's a smart guy. He knows the business of the NFL. He, he knows that. Paying, paid their yeah, and, and they've been friends. They've been brothers since like Alabama. So they I don't think there's any animosity. Yeah. All right. He's uh, he, like I said, he I'm sure he knows the business side. He's a smart guy. He knows that the deal you get is not the same as the deal the next person is going to get because the next guy up usually is going to get more than you no matter what the position is. Exactly. So at the end of the day, like I said, those guys are brothers. They've been boys since Alabama. They're going to continue to play together for the next couple of years here. And I don't think there's any animosity. And at the end of the day, Jonathan, I was a captain. And it's, yeah. So, yeah. It is no, it no. is a pretty sick flex for Deron Payne to be like, don't talk to me, peasant. I make more money. <laughs> uh, I can tell you that Deron's going to be paying for food tonight. I'll tell you that going out to dinner with sure. the boys. Um, but no, I don't think that John's going to get jealous because what was the one thing reason that everyone thought that, that fight happened on the sideline? Right, is that there was animosity based on John getting paid. John's not going to reciprocate that. I feel like John is a different type of in- individual, and he's not going to want to project what was possibly projected onto him before so he's probably going to take the higher road in that aspect because this is his boy and he under like hall said he understands the nature of the game this is a business and this is how it works there's nothing about there's no reason to measure our uh our d size like reed back in high school with all of his buddies and <laughs> i the always also lost too i always lost <laughs> also like he signed you, the you franchise just wanted tag. to play the game is all you just wanted to see that's, right. <laughs> that's why at parties i would do the light trick where you I lost the every time then, but you won every single time right and then turn them back on real fast and be naked and then turn them off again and people just get a big glimpse of me like that it's funny when you're you know, a small one it's funny if you have yeah, also like sexual assault the franchise tag was 19 million. So as soon as he would have signed that, he would have been making more than Jonathan Allen anyway. So it's kind of like, no matter what the contract situation would have been, he would have been making more than Allen. So I don't think that Allen look at looks at it as like, oh, he makes more than me, but I'm better and I'm the captain. So this isn't right. Like, nah. yeah. And now, yeah. Hall, what are your thoughts on the the Commanders re-signing Danny Johnson from Tony Shivers in the Discord chat? Thank you, Tone. Yeah, I like the signing. Uh, it's good depth pickup. Um, like Sam Fortier said, he's been a guy just like Jamie Rees has been kind of like practice squad, roster, practice squad, roster, bouncing back and forth. Finally gets a chance um, from none other than Ron Rivera, kind of like um, like kind of like Jeremy Reeves did as well, and gets out there, gets on the field, and shows that he has some type of worth to the team, and they rewarded him for it. Obviously, it's like a small contract when it compared to like an actual NFL, like, top tier cornerback but again when you're a depth guy special teams guy and a guy that's just going to be part of the rotation a guy that's been grinding it out for years to get to this point i definitely respect the move i like the move and i'm glad to have him back yeah really happy for him um i think that the most intriguing part from last year of danny johnson was his ability to produce in the outside corner because two seasons ago we kind of saw him at outside corner and it was bad dude a lot of people were talking crap I think it was in preseason actually he looked really bad on the outside and that's why everyone was saying he was going to be released I was like dude I think this guy is legit at nickel and that's why I think he should stay the fact that they were forcing him the outside was bad but then you saw him throughout the season he got better on the outside he became almost locked down in a way and so I'm very happy for Danny because he earned this but the fact that he progressed into being able to be productive on the outside and the inside I think is the versatility the position flex that Rivera and Jack DeVry are looking for and that's somebody you feel good wise in a depth aspect and moving in versatile piece just in case there oh, are any no. emergencies oh no <laughs> Fido's back oh no <laughs> what's up it's such a luncheon ass like emoji thing alright now That's this next sick. question from Chris Comerton Reed or Fido what's your opinion on the new linemen are they significant upgrades pretty sick pretty sick Hall, <laughs> oh, you got anything? 
<laughs> yeah, um, I like the uh, position flex. I know that's been a big uh, sticking point with Ron Rivera since he's got here. Got to have position flex. Got to be able to pay, play all the positions across the line. And obviously the two linemen they picked up, um, Cross has played center, left guard, and right guard. Uh, Wiley's played right guard and right tackle. So with a team that's uh, clearly had injury problems with linemen over the past couple of years, getting down to fourth, fifth string guys at some positions, I think it's good that uh, they got guys that can step into different positions throughout the line. Hopefully it doesn't come to that because, like you said, Kyle, like last year they had like 20 to 30 different offensive combinations, which is not going to be conducive to winning football up front. So hopefully these guys can uh, stay healthy and the same five for the most part can be up there. But definitely like the position flex with uh, both guys that they brought in. Yeah, now, the one aspect of this, Chris, I really like is the fact that like Andrew Wiley is like the outside tackle slash guard flexibility, whereas with Gates, it's the center slash guard flexibility. So it's like you almost get the inter interchangeable piece on the inside and the outside. And that's why I really like it. It was relatively cheap, $12 million between the two of them per year. And I think that's a really good thing to actually pay for because Nick Gates did do really well this season. I think Giants fans are really mad about it. He's 6'5", 307 pounds. He had a PFF rating of 60.3, only gave up one sack this year, and only had four penalties, and obviously had nine penalties over his career, like I said before. All right, Fido. Yeah, uh, I mean, obviously, as a furry and a juggalo, whoop, whoop, <laughs> I, um, I don't know a lot about football, but I will say this. Anytime you get somebody who's 6'6", sweaty, jacked, they're bent over like that. It's got to be a good thing, right? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Every dog has its day. I don't know. I'm gay. <laughs> uh, now this next question from Brandon Reinbold Hall. Did the commanders get Deron Payne's contract right? Is it the start of a new era with re-signing our own? <laughs> um, yeah, I think it is a start of a new era. You look at – um. Guy like Terry McLaurin, who everyone thought like, oh, they're not gonna, they're gonna let him walk. They're not getting the deal done. They finally get it done. Same with Jonathan Allen. Same with Deron Payne. Same with the guys like Danny Johnson, who have been grinders. as they come back. They say, hey, if you put in the work for us, we're gonna, re we're gonna reward you for it. Guys like Jeremy Reeves, obviously too. So um, I do think it's a new, uh, a new era here. Obviously, I know everyone was talking about the whole escrow thing and the new owners on the hook for Deron Payne's contract. I think I look at that as a good thing because that just shows that, like you said, they're continuing the what Ron Rivera has pretty much built here, which is which is what he said when he came in here is we're going to get guys that when they come up on the deals, if they put in the work, show us that they are growing and they're good players on and off the field, we're going to reward them for it. And I think he's done that so far. They've done that so far. And I hope that they continue to do that. Yeah, I, I absolutely do think that they got it right because given the fact that his year, his salary this year is two and a half million, and uh, yes, that's low, but he was given twenty eight million dollars and guaranteed at signing bonus, and so that automatically makes him feel good about this year, right? Well, then in twenty twenty four, he's getting fifteen million in fully guaranteed money. Then twenty twenty five, that's where he's getting the nineteen and a half million. If you look at it in comparison, that he was supposed to get the franchise tag this year for twenty million, they don't have to pay that until two thousand twenty five, and they front loaded it with a lot of cash i think they absolutely got it right brandon without a doubt now this last question from tim towner in our discord chat server fido over the last three years washington has had a history of drafting multiple players at one if not more positions of need would you expect that to continue this year meaning certain positions of strength like edge defensive line tight end wide receiver will go undrafted so we could focus on offensive line corner and linebacker yeah, yeah. Last year, uh, my master brought up a, a good point a few weeks before the draft, and he said, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, the commanders went defensive tackle in round two. And uh, I know some people, were, somebody was like, that's dumb. If that happens, I'm going to be so mad. And then he, then like a week later, he was like, see, it was a smart move. His name was Mark Tyler. But I'm getting <laughs> ahead of myself. Uh, yeah, I think that they have to. Uh, it's the draft is weird during the middle to late rounds. I think you're going to see them just kind of take shots on players that are the best player available, things of that nature. But um, they're, they're also looking towards the future. You know, I think that that's kind of what they were doing with Fedarian Mathis and Hey, it ends up he, he replaced uh, 
Tim Settle and Matt Ioannidis, and I think that was a huge thing. So I have no idea what I'm even talking about at this point. I don't know anything. <laughs> yeah, but, I think uh, you're right about that. I think we all know that at this point, Fido. But Hall, this next thanks, question Kyle. from Scott Hartley in the UK. Oi, thank you, Scott. Oi. Now we've signed a few players today. What's your best pickup, and what do you think we need moving forward in free agency? Um, do, 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 do. You gotta I think, think about that... it. they signed two offensive linemen. Yeah, they got a linebacker in Cody Barton, who's 6'2, 237 pounds. He's 26 years old. They re signed Danny Johnson, they re signed uh Kalik Hudson as well. Um, I still want to see him go out and because yeah, I think they're gonna draft a corner. They got Benjamin St. Jones, Kendall Fuller. I mean, I would like to see them go out and yeah, because I think they're going to get the corner of the future in the draft in the first round. I just want to see who the backup quarterback is going to be, honestly. I think that uh, that's probably like uh, another, like a lot of the uh, the people on Twitter are saying that's what the next domino they want to see fall. They want to see who's going to be backing up Sam Howe, who's going to be coming in for the competition for uh, the quarterback one position starter. So, um, yeah, I'll go with uh, – I just want to see who the, the backup is going to be. Yeah, and I think Cody Barton's um, how much he's getting paid, like Sam said earlier, is going to be huge. And being able to kind of realize what's going on here with that linebacking core, because now that you look at it, they they got they picked up Cam Dantzler, obviously. Um, they re-signed Danny Johnson. They got the two offensive linemen. They got the two linebackers, and those were the three big positions. I guess the other one you could say is tight end. But any well, even if you look at that, you could kind of say maybe they're kind of set at tight end in a way. So it's kind of awesome that Ron Rivera had talked about before that. They're going to want to do what they need to do in free agency so they can do what they want in the draft. And I think that they have done that at this point because they've added quality depth at a, not in a crazy amount, an exuberant uh, amount of cash. And they ha- are in a position where they can go best player available in the draft. And I'm really happy about that. Yeah. Hell yeah. Mm-hmm. Nothing, dude. Now, this nah. next question, <laughs> this next question from Brant. These O-line grabs make me think they sit that sitting up might to be able to grab best player available in the draft instead of need. What do you think? No, this I'm, is I, setting up. No, I'm, yeah, I still think that they, I still think that they need another offensive lineman, uh, if possible or corner. I mean, they still they re-signed some guys that they brought in Cam Dancer, but they still need somebody that's going to be on the field playing uh, just about every snap. Um, and Look, and when it comes to Benjamin St. Juice's injury history and Kendall Fuller, I we always say Kendall Fuller's getting up there. I always forget that he's still under 30 somehow. It's crazy. It is. But, he's uh, been in the league for, it feels like, 15 yeah, years, and right. he's not even um, 30 yet. Yeah, but uh, started at the tender age of 14, I heard once. that That's what <laughs> yeah. he was drafted at. Um, but no, now I still think the that, corner. Yeah, I still think that they're going to uh, go corner. I still think that they could go corner or offensive tackle. Yeah, and I think that is going to be best player available based on their projections. The fact that Christian Gonzalez with Jalen Ramsey, I think, is absolutely perfect and spot on. If we could get our hands on that guy, it'd be absolutely amazing. Uh, now, this next question from Prince Akeem. This isn't really a question, but he wants to know, like, how uh, other teams, like with Tyree Kill in Miami, who signed a deal last year, how come Washington hasn't had restructures like Hill did with the Dolphins and and pushing it to a signing bonus then opening up more cap because Washington hasn't made those moves yet. Yeah. Um, I was actually kind of curious about this myself because it seems like Washington never really does any type of restructuring or like maneuvering around to kind of shake a shake free some more money. And I guess I came across the salute. The, the answer is you actually need the cash to put up front for those type of stuff. And obviously with the reports out there that Dan Snyder doesn't really have the cash flow and he has all this debt and whatnot, it would make a lot of sense that they are not really able to maneuver around and uh, restructure guys or give them like uh, roster bonuses or signing bonuses. And like I said, because all that cash has to go to the player up front. So that could be maybe the reason. That's the only thing I can think of. No, I think you're absolutely right because I'll, 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 basically what's happening is – the Dolphins give him a big ass contract, and in the second year, they then change that contract to where all that money he was supposed to be owed in cap space, they just convert it to um, a salary bonus, right? And so that's how they kind of just liquidate it in cash and, and magically creates cap space for them. If you have the cash, do that. But the fact is, if you're good at your job, you shouldn't have to do that. It's a cheap way, it's a cheap way to use cash to get it done. More power to them, but I don't think Washington, like you said with Snyder, it's pointing out the obvious at this point that uh, the dude is just, you know, he doesn't have it in him to do what uh, Ross is doing down in, 
in Miami, unfortunately, and that's probably the only difference in it. Yeah, pretty sick move too, by the way. Super slick. It is. It is. That's, like, that's mighty I mean, New Orleans of them. Look at the Browns. I mean, they freed yeah, up they like thirty-six too. million dollars just by restructuring Deshaun Watson. Yeah. 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 Now and, this last question we have to put a lot of Jackson. Money. I'm just right. saying. <laughs> and they put a lot of money into their economy by bringing him in. Because this last question was are submitted so by much. Commanders <laughs> Call on Twitter through DM. Each year, we see the team making some moves at the beginning of free agency that are head scratchers, like releasing Flowers and Ioannidis last year. What kind of move could they make this year that would make us fans think they're smoking crack out in Ashburn? By trading for Austin Eckler. Yeah, that, that is where you go. Yeah. I don't know about all that. I think probably. Um, damn, I look. I love Austin Eckler. I would definitely be look like they're on crack. I don't know. Dude. I would be sized, but my thing is like Austin Eckler's a, a three down running back. back already too. No, but yeah. like Austin Eckler's a three down back. So if like, they release Sam Howell and sign Matt Corral, <laughs> <laughs> what are you going to do with Brian Robinson? You just drafted him to be a three down guy, and now you have Austin Eckler. It's like now what do you do with Brian Robinson? He's kind of just not really phased out, but I mean, meh. Got capped for nothing could in you, that case. Could you, know? you imagine them on the same field? Oh, my goodness, dude. They'd just be dinking and dunking and then just sledgehammer right up the middle. That's ridiculous. Like Eric Bieniemy would have wonders with that. Um, oh, but yeah. Any, but any team in the NFL would have deal. wonders with Austin Eckler. He'd probably Austin be coming here just for a one-year deal. That's the only reason why L.A. wants to get rid of him because they don't have to pay him. And so that's what Ken was speculating, like a fifth or sixth rounder for Austin Eckler. And for a one-year – Prove a deal? Sure, dude. Come on down. We don't have to give I mean, you that huge deal for a year? Yeah, come on. Shit, Miami signed a back or Miami traded a backup tight end and a third-round pick for Jalen Ramsey? I would have done that in a heartbeat. Kidding right. me? Yeah, that's true. I, I guess Jalen wanted to probably go down there. But maybe, oh, yeah, for sure. We'll see how it goes. All right, everybody, that's going to wrap us up for this episode. I can't thank you guys enough for joining us. Thank you to Sam48. Thank you to Kent LaPlotte. <laughs> 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 and that's going to be our send off. <laughs> All right, everybody. We'll see you uh, on Thursday. It's been a crazy. You should have waited till the end was like, I'm whole. <laughs> you should have waited. I, could, I just should have, but I couldn't hold it. I'm, if I, <laughs> something comes to my head, I have to do it. You got, that, of... you got that loose booty. You go, <laughs> barely. <laughs> extra <laughs> air coming out. It sounds like a, like a desert night. It's just. <laughs> <laughs> Stupid. All right, everybody. We'll see you on Thursday. Have a great, safe week. We really do appreciate you guys. And if you, uh, we forgot to do a prospect breakdown just because all the news has come out today. We'll do it again on Thursday. So if you guys have anybody you want us to break down, make sure you submit it in and we'll make sure to get it done oh, for today you. Today is Monday, isn't it? All right, everybody. Yeah. I'm Kyle. Oh, and uh, I'm Orlando Brown. This is the Disney Channel. <laughs> <laughs> all right, everybody. We'll see you later. Washington football. Woo! Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Kyle. I just wanted to say thank you so much for watching. And if you liked what you saw, make sure you hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. That way you get notified when anything new is uploaded to the channel. Also, we just launched theburgundyzone.com. You can go there and find all of our latest news, articles, and the latest episodes that are uploaded. Again, we also have the Discord chat server where all of our VIP folks are in, like Andy Burroughs, Scott Hartley, Sergio Martin is in there as well. Don't miss out on the Discord chat server. Go and check that out. Until next time, everybody, watching the football. Hey!